It is a fantastic and very much a personal pleasure for me to be here today uh, and to join you. You are the leaders of institutions that are collectively here today and individually uh, among the most important, uh, the most exciting, and I think our proudest national assets. And so it's an extraordinary honor and I'm conscious of responsibility to be the minister responsible uh, for institutions that nurture the lives uh, of yet to be written, the ideas yet to be realized, and discoveries yet to be made that will nevertheless define the future. University changed my life, and from the point that I arrived in Cambridge from a comprehensive school in Middlesbrough, uh, I've never wandered far from education's embrace, uh, whether in studying for my PhD at LSE, uh, postgraduate di diploma at King's College London, tutoring for the OU, or for the last few years being a visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford. Uh, so as well as expressing my personal gratitude, uh, the first thing I want to do is to thank you for everything you've done uh, for our universities over the last year. Of course, it's invidious to single people out, but I will anyway. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank uh, Alan Langmans for hosting us all today uh, and for his absolutely sterling work uh, at Hefke during a time of transformation, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Chris, um, brilliantly effective as a, uh, as a VC, uh, but he's proved, as I've known in my, uh, with my responsibilities for cities and growth uh, over recent years, uh, absolutely pivotal to securing investment from around the world uh, in the, the growing technology cluster uh, at Surrey. Uh, we're all grateful uh, to him for that, and of course for devoting his energies to UK. Uh, and of course, we'll all want to pay tribute uh, to the shrewd and effective leadership uh, that Nicola brings, uh, making you UK, there's no doubt about it, uh, one of the, uh, the most respected uh, institutions that gives a decisive influence uh, on public policy. Um, I want to say a big thank you to, to those uh, VCs who are moving on um, in the, uh, the months ahead. Uh, Robbins may have created a system uh, of HE, but we know it's a system of robustly independent institutions, uh, and that means vigorous and far-sighted leadership is required in every one of them. Let me hold up just a few examples. Uh, next year, Eric Thomas will retire as VC of Bristol University uh, after 14 years. Uh, he personifies that vigorous and far-sighted leadership. Uh, he's brought uh, over 250 million pounds into buildings and facilities uh, in the past five years. Uh, he plans to double it uh, by 2016. Uh, Eric is doing a great job as our UK international education champion. Uh, it's been no easy task bringing the, the many disparate parts uh, of the, the international uh, education field together uh, in that council, uh, but the, the right man for it is very much uh, Eric. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the OU's Martin Bean uh, is returning to Australia uh, at the end of the year. Martin has made a huge impact in opening up access to education in the finest tradition of the OU. Uh, his readiness to experiment with new technology, again something the OU has always done, uh, has brought OU resources to millions of people all around the world. Uh, with 66 million downloads uh, of OU materials on the iTunes U, uh, 22 million views on YouTube, and 33 million visitors to the OU's free content uh, on OpenLearn. Uh, and Howard Newby, another giant of the HE policy scene, will be retiring from the University of Liverpool next year. He's focused hard on pushing Liverpool as a global university. Uh, there can't be uh, many cities in the world that have a global reach and reputation more than, than Liverpool uh, has, and he's been building on that, strengthening uh, his links with China, uh, as well as establishing partnerships with Malaysia, Brazil, and India. Uh, the university uh, is now Europe's largest provider uh, of fully online postgraduate degrees with over, over 10,000 students uh, in 160 countries. He's one uh, of our great contributions to, uh, to exports. Uh, and of course, I'm pleased that Sir Howard is such a formidable successor in Janet Beer, the current VC uh, of Oxford Brooks. Uh, Janet, I know, has made the student experience a big priority uh, at Oxford Brooks, a vital component uh, of the sector's work. Uh, both in her own university uh, and in the sector more widely. She's also been a champion of equality uh, and diversity. And just to say a little about that, because on A-level results day, we were once again reminded that young women are surging ahead in higher education. I've been struck, though, at, just in the, the weeks that, that I've had this job, at how wide is the gulf uh, between entry to university 
and participation in the leadership uh, of institutions and indeed the sector. Only 17% of VCs uh, and 22% of professors are women. I know that everyone recognizes the challenge and also the opportunity that this presents. Strength in diversity is, of course, the theme of your conference. Uh, and I dare say that as well as uh, describing uh, one of the, the features uh, of the, the sector, uh, I'm sure I'm not wrong in detecting an ambition there, uh, as well as a reflection on its current attributes. I will do everything that I can to support you in driving forward measures that will open up universities to those whose representation uh, does not reflect still their full talent and potential. I'm well aware that as the new minister for this brief, I'm stepping into some very big shoes. Following on a man who was known uh, in politics as two brains uh, was always going to be a bit daunting. Now, David Willits is a good friend of mine, and I know that you really liked and respected him too. You appreciated his intelligence, his understanding, his fervent belief in the importance of higher education and science, and above all, I think his willingness to be open and accessible and to work very closely with you. And I think we should all pay tribute to what David Willits achieved in introducing our new funding system. Leading for the government, he transformed university funding. Now, the OECD's Education at a Glance report, this annual report that uh, was published today, I don't know whether on your way uh, any of you managed to, to look at it, uh, it gives a, a fantastically insightful picture on how we're doing at the global stage. And I think it really underlines the progress uh, that we made. Uh, I met with the, the lead author, Andreas Schleicher, of the OECD uh, yesterday. And he described the UK as the first European country that's established a sustainable approach to HE funding. Uh, this, as I don't need to remind anyone here, was no small task. But now that the hard work has been done, I think it's worth reflecting for a moment on how far we've come and how much better things are now than they would have been had David not grasped the nettle of reform. If applications meet expectations, then the resources available for teaching uh, will rise from £7.9 billion provided in 2011-12 to around £10 billion in 2015-2016. If we hadn't made these changes, you can be sure that the regime that you would be operating in as vice-chancellors would be much more difficult. In a climate of economic stringency, the alternatives are stark, and they would have been stark. Uh, the 2012 reforms are on track to deliver three billion pounds of grant savings uh, per year from 2015-16. If fees had remained close uh, to 3,000 pounds, those savings would still have needed to be found. What would that have meant? Well, let's assume that the cuts uh, would have been spread equally across students and universities. On the student side, that would have meant pressure to cut student numbers. Or to avoid this, we might have been forced to eliminate the maintenance grant completely. No more grants to help students struggling with their living costs. And at the same time, universities would have had to make big cuts to the teaching grant, but with no corresponding increase uh, in the fee income uh, to offset that. This would have meant, meant something like a 20% cut in your total income for undergraduates. Uh, and that would be a loss uh, of several tens of million pounds a year for many of the institutions here. Instead, the new regime, hard fought for, has been all, all about putting students and the value of the experience they receive at the very heart of the system, where it ought to be. It's been about increasing uh, information to inform choice, driving up the quality of HE, freeing you from the restrictive student number controls, and helping students uh, to get their first choice of university. Now, I wrote my PhD thesis in the Lionel Robbins building uh, of the LSE. It was a reminder of the enduring power of good policy over the lives of millions of people over the generations. And at a time when demand uh, is outstripping supply, uh, and the goal of achieving equal participation, regardless of background, is still far from attained, to have cut the number of students would have been to turn our back on Robin's vision, and to have sounded the retreat on the 50th anniversary of his great report would, I think, have been doubly shameful. 
To quote the man himself, higher education courses should be available to all who are qualified by ability and attainment to pursue them and who wish to do so. I stand by that principle. And because the new financial regime has put higher education on a more sustainable footing, we are, for the first time, in a position to make those words a reality. Opponents of our reforms warned that raising fees would put young people, and especially those from poorer backgrounds, off from going to university. The good news is that young people are continuing to prove the critics wrong. In England, the current application rate for 18-year-olds increased to its highest ever level, nearly 35%. And even more importantly, the application rate for 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged areas in England was also at a record high of 20.7%. The latest data from UCAS shows that more students from, disadvantages, from disadvantaged backgrounds have secured places at university than ever before. And as of the end of August, almost 22,000 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged areas have been accepted onto HE courses, a rise of 8%. This means that the gap between rich and poor in higher education is narrowing significantly. But, in my view, we still have some distance to travel. The lazy criticism of our agenda to open up higher education is that we're sending people to university who shouldn't go. This is the old Kingsley Amos, more will mean worse argument, and I simply don't buy it. Anyone who questions whether expansion is necessary should look at the recent data from Hefke on university participation by parliamentary constituency. This reveals some still shocking disparities across the UK. In Ryslip, in West London, for example, 65% of young people go into higher education. But in my hometown of Middlesbrough, just 26% of young people make it to university. And in the parliamentary constituency of Nottingham North, only 16% do. So let me be clear. As long as four times as many people get to university from suburban London as from the estates of Nottingham, I refuse to believe that the pool of ability is anywhere close to being exhausted. And I refuse to believe that there's something intrinsic about kids from Middlesbrough or Nottingham that means they're incapable from benefiting from a university education. I know that because these are the children of the kids that I went to school with on Teesside. And I remember thinking at the same time uh, about my classmates, uh, that when only a handful of them went on to the sixth form, uh, let alone university, that opportunities were being denied them that really ought to be provided. The aspiration gap is closing and at an accelerating rate, but we must and you must carry on doing everything we can to close it altogether. Whether through university or apprenticeships, we must ensure that from the early years upwards, every young person uh, is being prepared uh, and encouraged to make the most of their abilities. And this isn't just about undergraduate education. We know that more and more employers uh, are looking for master's degrees when they recruit. And we know that postgraduate education uh, in this country uh, is one of our great strengths. Uh, and I think that this means that postgrad education is becoming the new frontier in the battle to widen access. I want to find ways of, work, of working to, to make sure that the opportunity to do postgraduate study is available uh, for those who can benefit from it, to the further benefit of your institutions, uh, the individuals, and of course our country. We know employers also value students with work and international experience. Our international education strategy, as I, I referred to earlier, recognizes that overseas study and work placement as part of a degree offer students the opportunity to experience new cultures, to develop new language capabilities, and to gain broader skills that will make them stand out to employers. We want to see more students gaining international experience, and we fully support uh, the sector uh, in uh, your moves to, to increase the, the outward mobility of UK students. And I'm pleased to see that the Higher Education International Unit is implementing the strategy, uh, working to increase its profile within the sector uh, and to address barriers to, uh, to going overseas uh, and raising the uh, student awareness of the uh, opportunities that are there for them. And as part of this, I'm delighted to announce the launch of the new Go International website, which will bring together information on studying, volunteering, and working abroad, and will act as a platform for universities and colleges to share best practice. I hope you'll encourage your staff and students to make use of this online hub. Now, I know that students 
and their parents worry about the employment market for graduates sometimes. The outlook, in fact, is increasingly positive. The latest Destinations of Leavers of HE survey out this summer found that 88% of all full-time first-degree graduates were in employment and or further study six months after graduating. Two employer surveys have also suggested a rosier graduate jobs market. The High Flyer survey uh, the update, the summer update, uh, found graduate vacancies in 2014 uh, were up by nearly 12% compared to a year ago. And the Association of Graduate Recruiters Summer Review predicted a 17% increase in graduate vacancies uh, during the 2013-14 hiring season compared with the previous year. Going to university offers real returns for the individual. It also offers big returns for the country. In my ministerial portfolio, I'm retaining the, the role of Minister for Cities alongside higher education and science. Uh, and these three fit very neatly together. Universities are about ideas and research, and they're also about education and training. Uh, and all of these aspects are increasingly important uh, to the economic prospects of all nations. So as we fight to put our economy on a more secure footing, we'd be relying on universities more than ever before. When it comes to ideas and research, we know that across the country, a deepening association between universities and business is incredibly important, from spinning out new companies to helping existing businesses to innovate and grow. And cities, like this one we uh, meet in today, uh, across the UK rely heavily uh, on universities uh, to develop their strengths uh, and the skills of the people within them. I've seen time and time again in my work to boost growth in our cities, uh, the, uh, the increasing certainty that universities are right at the heart of that growth. The UK's nine regional impact reports did a wonderful job of spelling this out. In the Northeast, for example, you found that for every 100 direct full-time equivalent jobs created inside universities, a further 104 UK jobs are created in other industries. Uh, this is backed up by uh, research, long-standing research, by uh, Professor Michael Parkinson, uh, then at Liverpool John Moores, uh, who examined cities across Europe and found that higher education institutions in the regions do much to lift the economic vitality of their nation, uh, whether it's Munich, uh, Germany, uh, Tampere in Finland, uh, to places like Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester and Newcastle. Uh, Michael demonstrates the essential role that universities have played uh, in both the growth uh, of local innovation systems and in the development of the skills base. That's why I'm so delighted uh, that in every one of the 39 local enterprise partnerships, every one of them has a, uh, a representative from a uh, higher education institution on their boards. That wasn't a requirement, but the fact that in every single case, an HEI representative is on that board, uh, I think is a reflection of the increasing centrality uh, of universities to growth. And we don't need to look far for great examples of universities delivering growth. As the world shifts away from its dependence on fossil fuels, the new multi-billion pound markets uh, that are growing for bio-based products are increasingly attractive and increasingly important. Just up the road from, road from here, BioVale York, an exciting innovation cluster for biotech, uh, is capitalizing uh, on this market. Uh, the government committed uh, up to eight million uh, to this 49 million pounds project in July, uh, as part of the local growth deals that I spearheaded uh, in July. Uh, and that was for the, the Leeds uh, City Region uh, and the York, North Yorkshire and East Riding uh, local enterprise partnerships working together. BioVale Bio brings together industry with world-class researchers in biotech, chemistry and agriculture from the University of York, as well as providing new opportunities for brilliant engineers uh, from this institution. I'd like in particular to pay tribute to Professor Bob Cryan, the VC of Huddersfield, who sits on the board uh, of the Leeds City Region uh, LEP, and Professor, Professor Colin Mellors, uh, Pro VC at the University of York, who sits on the board of the North Yorkshire LEP. Both have been absolutely uh, fundamental uh, to the success of this initiative, not only promoting uh, higher education in their institutions, uh, but all of the private sector elements uh, in their respective growth deals. Meanwhile, at the other end of the country, of course, as I mentioned earlier, Chris, uh, through, the verse, un, through the University of Surrey, is at the forefront of growth in uh, information and communication technology, uh, specifically the coming revolution in mobile and internet access, 5G. A key element in the, uh, the, sorry, the Enterprise N3 uh, LEPS growth deal is support for the world's first dedicated 5G innovation center at Surrey. 
This will be a test bed facility with some fantastic experimental kit that local businesses uh, as well as university researchers uh, can access. Uh, and it's at the heart of some of the most exciting developments uh, that are uh, on the horizon, such as the Internet of Things, uh, smart cities, uh, and future internet technologies. Uh, Surrey should be proud, and I know it is proud, that they brought together such a strong consortium of industry partners and secured over £53 million of private investment uh, on top of £5 million uh, from the growth deal uh, and £11.6 million from Hefke's uh, ARPIF fund and a further uh, £4.9 million from the Catalyst fund. At the end of last year, we asked Professor Sir Ian Diamond and UK to undertake a review into where the HE sector could go further and become even more efficient and effective across both research and teaching. Ian's review is looking at important areas such as asset sharing, uh, estates, and the HE workforce. In fact, there's a great example uh, here at Leeds uh, where the N8 group of northern universities are collaborating to share a world-leading uh, 3.25 million pounds high-performance computing facility. Companies including EDF, National Grid, AXA, and Johnson & Johnson are also now working uh, with N8 academics to learn how this impressive piece of kit can help their businesses. So I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, again UUK and Professor Diamond uh, for their hard work. Their final report, uh, as you know, is due in February 2015, and it can play a very important role in informing decisions at the next spending review, uh, where you will want to ensure that the story is one of a sector delivering the highest value for students uh, and in research, and as Professor Diamond has, has said, scaling the twin peaks of excellence and efficiency. I believe that higher education is in a good place. You're in good financial health overall, the appetite for higher education remains strong, and universities are cementing their position as drivers of local growth. But I know in spite of these many successes uh, that most, most of you here, many of you here, most of you here, uh, will have concerns about the future and what it holds for your universities. And as I said at the beginning, I want very much to, to take David's approach uh, of listening careful, carefully to you uh, and being uh, your champion in government uh, for the concerns and seeking to address uh, them with my colleagues uh, where you have them. I think it seems perhaps appropriate to, to end uh, here today on the issue of admissions. Uh, as I know, this has been in the forefront uh, of your minds uh, in weeks past, uh, and uh, in the coming weeks uh, will, will be very much uh, in the forefront as you meet the new generation of students. And I'd very much like to congratulate UCAS, and I see Mary Kernock uh, here and, and Steve Smith uh, the, um, on the board of, uh, of UCAS. Uh, Mary and Steve uh, spent the uh, A-level results day together in Cheltenham. And I have to say, I think for all of us, it was an inspiring uh, experience, not just in the, uh, the, uh, the record numbers uh, that were reported, uh, but the brilliant efficiency uh, of the system as conducted there. Uh, and for those of us that had the, the pleasure and the privilege of listening in to some of the calls, the real professionalism combined with a real kind of personal uh, humanity and experience that gave guidance to each of the students on perhaps one of the most important days uh, of their lives. I think it was a, it was a tremendous uh, achievement, um, and I, I do want to recognize uh, through uh, Mary the staff that uh, contributed to that. Uh, it, was, um, it, it was a magnificent experience, and I think it really brought home to me, reminded me uh, of what a landmark day uh, it is in the lives of every young person as it was for me. I've talked a lot today about the importance of widening access to HE. Uh, as the 2011 Higher Education White Paper said, uh, ultimately the best way to widen participation is to ensure that there are sufficient higher education places available for those qualified. That's why we're abolishing the cap on aspiration, one of the greatest barriers to social mobility in this country. We we'll remove the cap completely uh, in 2015 to 2016, and as you know, this year we've allowed for an extra 30,000 uh, places in the system to give flexibility both to prospective students uh, and to your institutions. Uh, it's still early days, and we expected that this would translate in practice to something like 15,000 extra students this year. The early estimates that we have are that the outturn would be plumb in line with these expectations, representing a boost to many thousands of young people and an orderly transition to the uncapped numbers. The most popular and successful institutions can choose to grow. I think this is an important and historic time for this sector. 
And I would end by, by saying this. Whatever the challenges and the debates that will engage us, and engage us they will, uh, and uh, I want to be closely engaged with you uh, in that. The high reputation and the success of higher education and research in the UK mean that these are challenges that most countries around the world would kill to have. In so many respects, UK higher education is the envy of the world. So let me end as I began by thanking you for everything that you've done during the year past. Uh, and from this particular fresher, uh, to you as the leaders of our universities, to say how very much I'm looking forward to working with you, to getting to know you, and to give you all the help I can uh, in making the future of your institutions a source of continuing pride and achievement for all of us. Thank you very much indeed.